Thank you for taking your seats. You know, some years ago, um, there were some changes in our patent law in this country, and one of the changes, um, we were trying to align with other countries. What was the result is that the average cost of a patent went from about $2,000 to $10,000. And so it's, it's a real problem. But as you know, the free market generally responds to those challenges. And my next speaker comes from that background. Uh, John Wise is CEO and chairman of the board for Loci Incorporated, a high-growth tech company that is simplifying the patent processing system using blockchain technology. John brings a very diverse background to the Loci team. For more than 15 years, he's worked as a mechanic, crew chief, data engineer, and team manager for some of the top racing teams in this country, so automotive racing. Uh, and he witnessed hundreds of race innovations and saw how difficult the patent process was firsthand. So he has won several championships during his tenure. Uh, what he's going to be talking to us about today is the ethical way to an ICO. So would you please welcome John Wise. Thank you. Hey, everybody. How's it going? So my company's been through one of these token sales, and, and uh, we were a little bit under the radar. but. We were under the radar for a couple of really big reasons. One of the biggest things is that we wanted to do it ethically and we wanted to do it uh, within the scope of the regulations. Problem is, regulations didn't exist. It still doesn't, right? Uh, not in the US. We're, we're based in DC uh, and I've been around a lot of uh, the, the regulators legislation side of things um, just kind of by, by being, uh, being in the area of nature. And when we were addressing this problem, um, when we were thinking about doing a, a crypto raise, a, a token sale, we had a lot of issues around trying to see the best way to do things. Um, what we ultimately ended up realizing was that there really wasn't a best practice yet. Um, a lot of people were really focusing on what somebody had done before, what made the most money, um, what really kind of just in, in general went fastest. Um, a lot of people went through a big emphasis on marketing things like um, going live on an exchange, um, which we are also live now. Um, and I didn't really see that being a legal thing to do. It really isn't. In fact, the SEC, um, even though it doesn't have any clear regulations or guidelines on it, um, really doesn't like anybody to be marketing. So I wanted to spend some time and really talk about uh, the ethics involved in, in doing a crypto raise. Uh, and the, the, the reason that I really wanted to focus on that is that I think as we're shaping legislation and regulation around this country and other countries, you'll realize that the ethics uh, and the best practices that we come up with are really what are going to be shaping the regulation. What a lot of people don't realize is that the SEC, FinCEN, FINRA, um, and CFTC really don't have unlimited budgets. And guess what? They have to maintain and, and make sure that, uh, that all the public companies out there are legal as well. So they don't have the ability to go through everything. What they really need is, is help from the private sector. So I wanted to go through a couple of things here. Uh, if the remote works. There you go. So my background, uh, as, as was mentioned, I spent a lot of time as a race car and aerospace engineer. I spent uh, 15 years doing exactly that, um, mostly focusing on, on mechanical and aerospace uh, components, computational fluid dynamics, things like that. Super boring stuff, um, except for the races. The, those were kind of fun. Um, but what I got to see was I got to see a lot of really cool world-changing inventions that were done just because it made something work, made something work better and faster. Um, the problem with that was that the race car teams, uh, the, the racing teams, and sometimes the manufacturers really didn't want to share these ideas with anybody else. They didn't want to lose their competitive advantage. That inspired us to build a system that was started out originally as the Wikipedia for inventions, and then spread to being a uh, highly liquid asset, uh, a highly liquid asset class that was tradable over crypto and blockchain. Going a little bit forward, I wanted to ask anybody that's doing an ICO, is there anybody here that's in the middle of a token sale or getting ready to do one? Three or four? Anybody else that invests, buys tokens, anything along those lines? Okay, 
most, most people here. So I wanted to prompt a couple of questions that anybody that's buying in and especially anybody that's launching a token sale really needs to ask. The first thing, what's your mission? Right? What's your true mission? Um, to break this down a little bit further, what's your why? Right? You don't need to worry about the what or the how it's going to get done so much. What's your why? The second thing is, would your model work without a token? Could you accept BTC? Could you accept ETH or whatever else? Right? If yes, then do that, please. Um, we really don't need more tokens. Um, some of them have a good use case, but we really don't. If you can just accept a currency, do that. Another big thing is if it's for a capital raise, trust me, it's not efficient to do an ICO. Um, it's really expensive. And if you do well, you could go to jail. If you do poorly, you could go to jail. Um, and then you're broke either way. So you know, let's, let's, let's be smart about it, right? Um, if you're just accepting a currency in BTC or ETH, you're likely not going to. The other really big thing that I'd like to push is what's your intrinsic value, right? What's the thing that really makes your token valuable in all sorts of ways? Um, one of the things that Loki did that was, that was unique here was when we were planning on doing, um, doing the token sale and launching a crypto, we needed to figure out how we were going to actually do the utility, right? We stumbled upon something that was very, very, very simple. We had an existing product that was selling for $250 per user per month. And when we launched the crypto, we just said, oh, we'll do $250 or 100 coin. This is a very simple thing to do, and it's something that every crypto company can do. But the point of that is that ultimately, by giving an out there, as long as you sell through the entire sale, the token raise, as long as you sell below that $2.50 mark, there's an intrinsic value, there's an equilibrium floor price at $2.50 per token, right? Which means everybody has the opportunity, and, and a pretty legitimate opportunity, I obviously can't say guaranteed, but as long as the product is being used and has existing users, any time that price is below $2.50, it incentivizes users to pick up the tokens, buy the tokens, and use that. Um, we're also the first company that had ever done an equity raise before. I think we're the first company that had ever launched with an, uh, an existing finished product that was already had sales. And we're, looks like we'll be the first company that'll be doing an equity raise after, which is crazy. And I'll get into the valuation metrics a little bit later. Be more than a white paper. Be more than a white paper, right? Raise equity capital. Stand up a business first. Understand what it takes to be in business. And for the investors in the room, look at the operators of the business, right? Not the thought leaders, not the people that are coming up with the ideas, the concepts in general. Those people are great, right? But you need to know that this is a company. These are companies. And business is hard. It's really hard to do. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of late nights. It takes a lot of passion. And it sucks. So make sure that you get operators that you know understand what it's going to take to actually run a business. Right? Whether it's a for-profit, non-profit is kind of irrelevant. But make sure that the operators are good. Now, the reason that I suggest raising equity capital before is it really requires two things. One, it requires the operators of the business, or the, the founders of the business, to go through the really tough process of divvying up equity. Right? During that equity process, a lot of people shift around. Right? Everybody within a company from, from a startup, this is my third business, by the way, um, from everybody within a startup, they always feel, um, the founders especially, always feel that they deserve more equity, and it ends up actually um, uh, kind of cutting the Achilles heel of a lot of the businesses. So you'll lose half of the team often when you start to divvy this up. Putting an actual dollar figure on what somebody's worth is typically sheds half the team. If they've gone through an equity raise, they're requiring to do that in the first place. The second thing is that they understand how to raise capital. Right? They understand the metrics. They understand what a valuation metric is. I really shouldn't have to explain what an EBITDA is to so many people. Every single day, I have to explain what an EBITDA is. This is a very, very, very basic valuation, right? this strategy. You, you have to understand 
Um, and for those that don't know, EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. It's one of the basic, basic, basic metrics that you need to be able to run a business. Another big thing from a marketing perspective, market a cause, not an investment, right? Everybody right now is listing these tokens as a utility token. Guess what? They're not investments. If the thing doesn't have utility and it doesn't have a decent intrinsic value and a cause, it doesn't really matter, right? The rest of it's just pump and ultimately that's illegal. So I wanna talk a little bit about regulation. Um, this is mostly for the investors, token purchasers, early adopters, whatever somebody wants to call them. Um, certainly for us, because it is, our product is utility, uh, nobody's an investment, and I, I make sure to emphasize that uh, quite often. Do your own research into the market share, the market opportunity, the, oper the operators themselves, right? And more, most importantly, in my eyes, ask, what's your why? Retain really strong legal counsel, both for the investors and for the, the ICOs. Um, most of the lawyers out there are making an absolute killing off of doing token sales, and I'd say most of them have no clue what they're talking about, because it just doesn't exist, right? The regulation doesn't exist. There is no guideline. Be more than a utility token. Have utility. Have actual utility. Have sales. Have revenue. Or at least have a beta that has people testing it. Right? And lastly, be careful with what you say and where. Um, anybody that's on Telegram groups here, please do not ask when Moon, when Lambo, when Exchange. Nobody can actually talk about these things to begin with. And, and I want to want to emphasize the point that for somebody that's been listed, um, there are gag orders and NDAs. As soon as a company actually says when an exchange is, that exchange opportunity is gone. So simply asking that question is probably going to remove the possibility of it actually even getting listed. Um, that's a really big thing, right? If you want something to moon, if you want something to go up and you want it to get liquid, don't ask. They're working on it. A real business is going to work on it. As long as the community managers and the team is involved, that's all that really matters. Right? So as an engineer, I want to always think about things from an economics engineering perspective. You know, we're, we're building new economies now. We're building new structures entirely. We really ought to think about some things. As an engineer, I've worked in aerospace, I've worked on jets, rockets, race cars, all sorts of other things. And one of the biggest questions I like to ask is, is it airworthy, right? Is this project airworthy? Are there redundancies built into the system? What happens if the team, if the founder dies, passes away, right? Uh, uh, last year, we, we had a, a spoof that Vitalik had gotten in a bad car accident and the price of ETH had crashed. That happens in real life, right? People actually do get hurt or sick or whatever else. They're people, right? So redundancies in the ecosystem are a really, really key thing. And also, I want to emphasize the term ecosystem, right? Not token economics, right? Not even economics, ecosystem. It should have a flow to it. Set the example, not because, or be, because it's right, not because it's typical. Right? If we're going to make the best practices for the industry, for the space and everything else, focus on the right ways to do this. I also want to talk about how much you really need. How much do you really need to get in a raise? $100 million is ridiculous. For a company that is a good operator, they should understand exactly how much risk they're taking by taking $100 million, okay? Think about the minimum needed for a successful network launch. And also, um, I think we were the first SAFT out there. Um, I worked with Cooley quite, quite a bit on these. Um, anybody that's going through a SAFT or anybody that's buying into a SAFT, keep in mind that the money from the SAFT must be used to launch a network, okay? It must convert. A SAFT is a futures contract. It has to convert before they can do a token sale, okay, a public sale. If they do not convert, if they do not launch the full network, get out as fast as possible because they are going to go down guaranteed. Set a reasonable hard cap and soft cap. And most importantly for the companies and anybody else, right, this is a great, great, great test for any investor, never refuse a refund. 
Okay? We are marketing and selling these things as utility tokens. That means it's a product that you're selling. If you go into any store and you don't like your product, you should be able to get a refund. Okay? Serve the community. Community is everything in this space. Be there, be present, and for the entrepreneurs in the room, be engaged, be involved. We have a very small community, but I love it, right? Every half, half this room, I think, uh, I see a lot of common faces. A lot of these people here are in our community, and for exactly that reason, I get on every day and talk, right? Sure, I have other stuff to do, but that, this is important, right? Encourage feedback and, uh, and adapt the community concerns, right? Like refunds. In conclusion, blockchain and cryptocurrency opens up a mass participation in a new economy. The, the decentralization movement needs responsible trailblazers. It needs to have people that really think about these concerns, that think about ethics. Um, I'll close with one of the most eloquent ways I've ever heard cryptocurrency being described. A friend of mine said, you know, launching a token, launching a cryptocurrency is mutable. It's trustless. It's a trustless system in general. It never goes away, regardless if you did well or you did poorly, it's never going to go away. It's akin to setting a wildfire, right? Now, everybody understands that wildfires are required in order to burn the old, the old ways, right, and promote new growth, new species, all sorts of other things. We're okay with the wildfire. We get that part, right? Putting any money in is just like adding fuel to the fire. We're okay with that. But what we want to know is that the people that are setting the fire are smart enough, are ethical enough, and have really considered all of the possible variations, right, and all of the risks. We want to know that those people have gotten others out of harm's way first and foremost. If you feel at any point that they haven't, don't do it. We really, as a whole here, as a community, we really need to stop promoting crappy ICOs, right, and crappy use cases, and really push the emphasis towards projects like Ethereum and Bitcoin, you know, and, and, and whatever else, ideally, and Loki. Those that are really pushing the boundary. So thank you very much for everything. Uh, please connect. Please stay in touch. I'm around all the time. Um, come and find us on Telegram. Uh, I think it's Loki underscore Inven. So I'd like to open it up with, uh, with any questions. I'll be around for a little bit. So, anybody, if if anybody has any questions, just step up to the uh, mic here, please. Hi, I'm Ranjan. Uh, you mentioned that uh, in order to raise money, you'd need to think about you know how much you're raising in terms of capital and hard cap. Mm -hmm. And you said like around $100 million was something you need to think about as an entrepreneur. What are your thoughts about uh, Telegram raising uh, $1 billion from private investors? Well, um, what are my thoughts on it? I, I think it's a lot, right? So uh, I don't have enough time to really explain valuation metrics, um, but one of the biggest things I think that we need to think about here is the, the, the mere fact that market capitalization of a cryptocurrency or a token is not the same as the market cap of the business. Um, people really need to think about not only how much they're raising, but what the market cap opportunity is. Um, for a company raising a billion dollars, I, I think um, Telegram's market cap of their business to begin with was about 15 billion. Um, when they're adding in a billion in, in assets, coming from a crypto raise, uh, and then also expanding that out into secondary markets. You know, right now, you could say that their valuation and market cap overall, including the crypto, will probably be about $30 billion. Um, that would suggest that they'd need to be over a $150 billion company in the first year in order to make a 5x return for anybody. Um, those metrics just don't really make sense. That being said, that is a stood-up company. They have real operating expenses, and to operate at that level to begin with, the runway is substantially higher. Um, what they're talking about doing is pretty, pretty lofty. It's pretty exciting, um, but it's a lot of money. I think they actually raised 2.6 billion, by the way. Um, 100 million, I think, is way too high of a number for a startup in general. Um, I look at a lot of waste within startups and entrepreneurs. 
And I, I, I personally, I think from all of our math and our metrics that we've done in the past, we've done a lot of analysis. Um, we've got multiple economists that, that are on staff. Um, when we did our raise, the perfect number was 19.3 million. Um, that was pretty much exactly what the market should and would bear. The, the issue with that is that the, the marketing side of it shows that, that there's no hype, right? There's no, there's no pump to it. So I think the projects that are 30 million and below really catch, catch my eyes. They have the most market cap opportunity, and that's ultimately what drives the value, the ROI for you. So. Hi, my name is here. I'm uh, asking a question now from the sense of use of funds as against just a source of funds. Um, when the money is raised in ICO, uh, predominantly at least uh, nine out of 10 white papers that I read, I don't get to see any vesting schedules. Um, if I'm on the VC side doing due diligence or if I'm on the private equity side doing due diligence for any of these companies, there should be a skin in the game. Yeah. Uh, and there's a shortage of developers right now. I understand that's For the I'm founders, maybe, you're saying? Right, both yep. founders, early investors, or even the developers, right? Um, what are your thoughts on vesting schedule and with lack of governance like that and people getting up and walking away? For example, the founder of Cordano just got up from Ether, walked away, created his own thing, raised some money there also. Mm -hmm. A few, several other folks have done that. They just picked up you know, either the Ether or what are the projects they're working on and then just walked away with them without really having the skin in the game. Yeah. Now that, that leaves the folks who are banking on this project to go to the so-called moon and have all the unicorn and uh, rainbows, yep. not ever seeing this. So in a way, this is cheating and unethical for, for the rest of the community uh, on the whole. So your thoughts on Westing and your thoughts on governance? Yeah, so a couple of things. So this is one of the, the, the big reasons I say to have companies that have raised equity in the past um, that equity disbursements almost always comes with a vesting schedule, especially for the founders. Um, vesting schedule is a difficult subject in general, right? Um, for anybody that's buying in, the vesting schedule, really want to get them to, to liquidity as fast as possible. Um, pretty much any SAFT that doesn't have a vesting schedule in it in the first place, um, not going to be probably a real thing. Um, but you're right, skin in the game is a, a difficult balance. I, I, I think for the founders, their, their tokens really ought to have a vesting schedule in general. Um, but at the same time, I think it comes much earlier than that, right? If, if somebody's raising through a SAFT, they need to have a network launch event anyway. Um, they shouldn't be able to get any tokens until that network launch event occurs at, at, at the bare minimum, um, especially not any, any ETH or payout in cash. Great. Uh, this is one of the best sessions I have at attended. Thanks for bringing in Thank uh, you. to the reality. Uh, <laughs> oh, God so, forbid, right? So uh, my question is, um, I, uh, you said that uh, be more than white paper. I totally agree with you. Um, so we have to go beyond white paper yep. and have a prototype ready. But when it comes to go to ICO or a token sale, there are two uh, conflicting forces, right? Do we need to bring the community and bring in your customers first or go to market first? Sometimes what happens is that you have a brilliant idea and you are acquiring your customers and uh, you lose the opportunity. Time mm -hmm. to market is also a key factor. Mm -hmm. What is your thoughts on that? Um, well, let me clarify this question. So, so you're saying time to market for the product? Yeah, product, building the community, right? Yeah. So let's say you have a beta product, right? So mm -hmm. if you have a beta product, you know, you need to see the adoption, right? So in order to see the adoption, it takes some time to get the more users, right? Yep. yep. But Scaling at the same hard. time, you know, if you delay a little far, you may be delayed. You know, somebody else will come up, come to the market. Time to market is very key sure, aspect. Sure, sure. So, so one of the best ways around this is actually something that we work on, intellectual property, right? Um, I, I would suggest that anybody that's looking to buy tokens or buy into an ICO, um, one of the first questions you should ask is, have, have you done a patent infringement check? Right? Um, people don't really think about this, but a white paper is essentially a, a provisional patent in many respects. Um, you're releasing what the technology is. If it is infringing on a patent, um, guess what? All of it's going to go away, right? It's all coming in as deferred revenue anyway. Um, all of that money is going to go away, and then they likely have a, a, a suit as well. The reason that I bring this up for this is, that's also a great way to have fixed assets, right? 
if the if the company or the foundation has fixed assets under their under their nose and un, under the books, right, um, they can really solidify a lot more of the value, the intrinsic value of the company, and uh, and scaling in market opportunities, all sorts of other vehicles. Then they can also do uh, licensing. They can do other uh, other opportunities. So. Running out of time, but yeah, then. So thank you. Okay, one last brief question, and then we're all we'll have to wrap up. Okay, I'm going to make it very fast. Thank you sure. very much for such educative uh, section. Uh, the question I'm going to ask is uh, just for us within the cryptocurrency community, uh, we are aware of what has happened recently with the boom of the ICOs, and mm. uh, some of them has been very fraudulent. So within the community, what is the obligation? for uh, some of the ICOs have never seen their filtration. They just disappeared, and obviously with people's money. I don't know whether, you know, it's not regulated, definitely, but... What, what, what are the questions to ask? So I'm talking about what, is there anything that holds them accountable for people's, uh, you know, you know money that... No, have no, ultimately there isn't. Um, again, this is why I say stand up a real business. You know, only buy in on things that are real companies. Um, again, whether they're for-profit or not, not-for-profit, um, there is fiduciary responsibility for the founders and, and, and the, um, the C-suite. Um, having that legal and, um, and ethical sort of bias, right? And, and again, creating a movement, marketing a movement, not a, uh, not a, a pump or a token. Um, it, it holds them responsible in many respects, right? Um, Again, if there are assets within the company, then, then you're aligning the incentives of, of the business, of the founders, and of the token holders. If there are assets, there, there's intrinsic value within the company, they're incentivized to stay within the company and make sure that that thing grows. Um, if, they, if they don't have anything, then, then these are uh, uh, disaligned incentives, right? It's, it's, it's a fundamental flaw, I think, in many respects. Um, but that's also how things move really quickly, right? Is to is to not have that um, their feet to the fire. So anyway, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Sorry that we're out of time.